And what I'd like to do is just start off with a simple video uh, to show the product that we develop in action. It's easy to understand why cordless tools are so popular on the same lines. Their flexibility, lower cost due to lack of cable management, and constant improvements in battery technology are just a few reasons. However, this freedom comes at a cost, because when tools can be used anywhere, crucial error-proofing processes can suffer dramatically. Now, that problem is solved. With the Atlas Copco Tool Location System, TLS, you have total control of your tools. Not just where they are, but also where and when they'll work, with traceable results. The Tool Location System is like a small-scale GPS. Instead of satellites, sensors are placed throughout your plant. Products and tools are easily located by placing TLS tags on them. Atlas Compco Tensor ST and STB tools have tags powered from the tool, fully integrated, with no need for batteries. This is how TLS works. To locate a particular tag, each sensor determines the angle of the incoming signals, as well as the time difference between them. By using two sensors, a precise 3D location can be determined. Additional sensors increase accuracy and reduce deviances due to possible radio interference. When a TLS-equipped tool enters a predefined workspace, an indicator shows it's online and ready to work. However, outside the area, a virtual box, it's disabled. This guarantees workability only in selected workspaces. Another important feature of the TLS system is the transmission of product identification when the tool enters the product space. This eliminates the use of a manual barcode reader, saving time and providing an extremely reliable error-proofing solution. In fact, time savings from eliminating barcode readings can be more than one hour per station, per day, depending on production volume. And that's a lot. Besides providing extra mobility to operators, adapting and rebalancing the assembly line is cheaper and faster. Maximum flexibility. Assembly line use shows TLS will pay for itself in an impressively short time. Effective operator guidance, predetermined tool settings, reduced reworking and scrapping, all means increased productivity. And it takes error proofing to the next level. Atlas Copco is an experienced world leader in power tools and has a global network for service and support which means reliability and availability. Every tool and solution we introduce is engineered to be better for both business and the environment. The tool location system is just another excellent example. So that's a, one of the world's largest industrial conglomerates used, using Ubisense technology to take location out to its marketplace. And to put that into the context of our business, I think I'll ask Andy to start by talking about location and to give us some context of how this technology came out of the lab. So uh, you'd expect uh, the engineering uh, component uh, here in Cambridge to be at the leading edge, and this is at the bleeding edge and has been and continues to be. So uh, Cambridge, and I'm talking about human capital here, um, and in particular Ubisense, but not just Ubisense, is the world's leading center for precise indoor location. And this is damn hard to do. Tagging something and having reliability with BMW, for example, one failure per quarter in the location and hence the consequent control is very hard to achieve. And so in addition to patents, uh, our barrier to entry, this is just hard and we're the world uh, center for it, having started projects in this area uh, in the late 80s. So just tick that one off, but actually it's a strong advantage because it's one of these things where, uh, for this sort of application, it's easy for the customer to set up a test. You can't obfuscate what your system is doing. And we win all the shootouts, so I think 
we've never lost a deal because somebody else's technology is better. But let me just say, in addition to the human capital, the way the world has changed over the life of the company, which is now uh, 12 years old. Um, in, in 2002, uh, the notion that location, sensing and location, would be omnipresent was partially there, but it mainly related to GPS and outdoors. Today, because we all have mobiles, all the users, all the workers in the example given have mobiles, um, uh, the notion that you can sense location is completely accepted, omnipresent, everybody comprehends it, and whether at the very precise end of things required for our industrial grade applications, or whether us all as consumer applications saying, you know, you're near uh, somewhere and it, that place is throwing you an offer or whatever as a result of using mobile phone, we're completely uh, in the middle of this wave of understanding. And therefore, the barrier to entry in terms of customer acceptance has changed uh, over that time from us having to be heroes <laughs> to the doors being very wide open uh, in every possible uh, way. Uh, and so, uh, whether convincing the uh, uh, CFO, what it boils down to, to place the order, or the person on the shop floor, and not the early adopter, your regular person, that this is okay, it works as follows, here is on, has complete, I mean, it's just gone from uh, one uh, to the other. And therefore, um, uh, that is good, and commercially, uh, 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 we've established a very substantive presence so that in the, in the car manufacturing business, it's just step and repeat for us, just dominate the world in this particular sensing, one in every factory on the planet that does cars. However, just to finish off this picture and show you why certainly I aspire for this to be a billion market cap, and I don't mind whether it's pound or dollars company, but, but I can see this, is, is the other component. In addition to uh, the hard industrial stuff, uh, we do have substantive presence on the software side, and we're mostly a software company, of keeping track in databases of where things are, uh, things that don't move very fast, but move to some extent. Um, and therefore, if you have a product which is uh, going to use that information, for example, how many of your, and this is a specific example, of your uh, uh, broadband cabinets have been washed out by the latest flood, and what can you do about it, and how quickly based on the location of those things. We have the software systems that um, um, uh, enable this. So if you now combine the hard end of the industrial world, you combine being a, a computer software systems platform and product platform for all sorts of spatial fact information, and you look at the proposition that the digital world your Googles will converge to some extent or, or overlap with the industrial world. That's and, and we have a you know we have a more than a sporting entry in, in both those games from a uh, product and margin point of view. Uh, I very much hope that this come, from our point of view this coming together of the people understanding and using this stuff right across a broad spectrum of things, and us having a set of products which have difficulty in addition to all the obvious things as, as a barrier to entry. I think there's every chance that uh, uh, either we uh, hit that market cap or we have a very pleasant surprise out of the blue somewhere. Thanks, Andy. So to turn all of that research and that competitive advantage into, into money is all about finding a niche market that we could go off and dominate. and. The one where we really excel at the moment is in very difficult, challenging environments where other things just simply don't work. So the video we showed <clears throat> just simply wasn't possible to run with any other technology. And so having a precise location in a factory 
and precision is all about not just accuracy, it's about reliability, <coughs> is, is really critical. In fact, mission critical. So every day there's a thousand minis coming off the production line in Cowley. If our system stops working, they stop making cars. That's fairly mission critical. And it means the customer's prepared to pay quite a lot of money for a system that will enable that. And from that competitive advantage, <coughs> we've found that the customer actually wants to track things end to end across the whole factory, not just indoors, but outdoors too. And there's a whole series of application areas that demand to know where the product is as it's going through its journey from raw material to, to finished product. And so the team have been on a journey turning those locations into some intelligence that we can make money out of. So all the way from applications to do with bringing material into the factory, all to do with producing the, 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 the product at the end and then shipping it out, is built on this platform that the team have put together bringing data from a lot of different sources, whether it's our own precise real-time location system or a GPS system or an RFID system. All those different sources are pulled together and produce intelligence that can then drive the applications that the customer needs. And we see here that vision of a, of a virtual factory. So these are screenshots of the system in operation. And this happens to be in an area called off-track. So off-tracks in a car factory is a fairly ad hoc process. Quite hard to believe that production lines aren't just a linear process. But when cars come off the line, uh, <clears throat> they go through a, a whole series of rework steps. And it's quite hard for a, an individual to keep in his head where 250 cars are, and that's how many mini we work every day. 250 cars that haven't come through the production process perfectly. So to try and keep that in mind and then try to analyze where they need to improve that process is quite hard. But if you're measuring that activity, you can then start producing some intelligence on the basis of that, producing some reports <coughs> that can gain some insights into what can be changed in the, in, the, in the production process. And a really good example of this is this Mini line. And in November, Mini introduced a completely new model on their line. And they didn't have to change the line in the tooling at all to introduce a, a new model, simply because our system was there and enabled them to do that. So it really does give them complete flexible manufacturing. And <coughs> just simply replacing that barcode scan that you saw in the video in Volkswagen <coughs> saves them 11 minutes a car. That's incredibly valuable. And the whole production process you know, is five hours from raw material to finished product. 11 minutes is fairly significant. So there's a really compelling return on investment for the customer. And you'll see how we've taken that and driven that through the market. Of course, Automotive manufacturers are fairly global, so to sit, and sit here in Cambridge and address the UK market really wouldn't get us <clears throat> to the customers that we needed to get to. So we started in Germany with BMW, we're now installed in Regensburg, in Munich, in Cali, in Spartanburg, in Tishi, in China, in Dingolfing. So that's all their major car plants. So we're a standard across their business. <clears throat> Whenever they build a new plant, we get installed as part of that production process. Uh, we've got the same relationship with Daimler. We quite recently won Volkswagen, and we're stepping out through their major factories. And a lot of others uh, along the way, Honda in North America, Hyundai in Korea. And just car assembly plants, there's something like 500 plus around the world. So it's quite a large market. We've got a huge competitive advantage, and we're driving it home as hard as we can. <coughs> It turns out that 20% of the world's cars are German. <clears throat> we dominate the German automotive manufacturing market at the moment. And so we're looking at how we can take that great example and step and repeat it around the world. And it's not just manufacturers that have locations of things in real time. So there's utilities and telcos too. And so we've started introducing our software 
into a market that many of us knew from our previous company before we started this one. And we're getting quite a lot of traction with some very large utility and telco companies around the world as well. This time, the things they're locating, <clears throat> the things that happen in real time are events and they're all to do with location. So this is an example of a cable TV company in New York responding to uh, the storm uh, last fall where a lot of the devices at the end of the network went out. So suddenly the call center was inundated with real time events and they had to respond to that. So that same location intelligence platform could pull in lots of sources of data and help them figure out how to dispatch crews to go and fix those faults. And there's a lot of <clears throat> other people who need to enable their businesses with the same location intelligence. So you saw the video from Atlas Copco. Uh, there isn't a manufacturer on the planet that doesn't use one of their tools. So in terms of introducing us into a large market, they're certainly capable of doing that. Uh, a small logistics company called NYK, <clears throat> every year they, sh they move four million cars in China alone. And they've chosen to standardize on our product. They're beginning to install it in ports in Shanghai. Uh, Daifuku is uh, the Siemens of, uh, of Japan. They build a lot of the factories for the Japanese car manufacturers have embedded in a, in a safety system they built and some others as well. So in terms of scaling our business, having established it in a, in a key vertical market, we're starting to find third parties that can take us into other markets. And in terms of the business, uh, we're 240 or so strong now. Uh, at the end of last year, we made a, a major acquisition in Japan and Korea to service a large part of the industrial manufacturing market. But Germany's uh, the poster child for us. We began there first. We've got customers with all the major uh, automotive manufacturers. We have a very profitable business unit there. Uh, so we're looking at how we can replicate that. And a customer list we're all very proud of. You know, a lot of household names uh, in all those markets. And they're big relationships. Once you get a relationship with these customer, customers, we keep them. We keep finding opportunities to draw deeper within that customer base. So BMW has been a customer for five years. We've just renewed a five-year relationship with them. So they'll continue and we'll continue to explore ways of applying the technology in different parts of their business. And of course, it's all about uh, investment here today. We're delighted that Amati invested in us. Uh, we floated the company in 2011. Some would say it's probably a little earlier than we should. It's quite difficult to predict our business when we've got some very large customers who place some very large orders. Sometimes an order can move from December to January. It makes a big difference to our numbers. But it's getting easier. Uh, you know, the revenues are growing quite quickly. Of course, we're in a quiet period, so I can't actually say the real numbers, but we're in the uh, right spot in terms of our revenues last year. So if anybody reads the analyst reports, you'll know that that was in the order of 27 million. This year, it's looking as though it'll grow by about 10 million or so. So that's quite healthy growth. And hopefully, that will give us the opportunity to increase the contribution at the bottom line. We've done it in Germany very successfully. It's a matter of repeating that in, in the other markets. Uh, we're very happy with the support we get from the investment community. Uh, you know, a, a very solid list of investors. And so in summary, uh, you know, location in, in the 11 years we've been in business has turned up everywhere. Uh, I think the most recent mobile uh, World Congress, I think was inundated with people with new uh, takes on location and we've really focused on, on a very hard industrial sector and I think we've got ourselves very established there. Uh, manufacturing of course is, is a, a key market for us and to dominate the German market and be very profitable there I think is a great start and we need to repeat that in Japan, in the US, 
two other key markets for us, uh, Korea, and then hopefully in France and the UK. Uh, we're on the market to, to grow the business. Uh, we've made some acquisitions uh, over the years. We made uh, one last year, two the year before, and we'll continue to look for sensible acquisitions that will complement the business that we have. Uh, and the plan is simple. To be a billion dollar company, we have to dominate this industrial real-time market. Uh, we've got a very good chance of doing that. And it's without all the puff and the foo-foo dust. Uh, it's not <clears throat> the internet of things or big data or any of that stuff. Uh, on PowerPoint, we're doing it for real. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Richard or Andy? Yeah, please. What percentage of your revenue comes from is recurring? license fees or service or consumable? This year, probably mm, 25%, 24, 25%. There's, a, there's an opportunity to get a lot more, of course, as we get locked into these big businesses, but uh, we'd like it to be a lot more than that. Perhaps uh, answering the question in a slightly broader sense, we've never lost a customer. Once they stick, they stick. It's more a question of when does the next order coming. So in that sense it is very repeatable. But you will understand the SME selling to very large companies, which is what we do, is a, a, a difficult uh, but a huge opportunity. Any other questions? Can I, can I ask Richard, at, at the moment what, what proportion of sales come direct and what proportion are coming from Atlas Copco and other partners? Probably about 90% direct. You know, we're starting to see, in Germany in particular, third parties beginning to look at the success that we've had and the pull there is in the marketplace. Of course, when you begin, you're pushing into the marketplace. I think Germany were quite well established, so there's enough presence there for third parties. So we've got some, uh, some mid-tier companies uh, beginning to take us into other markets. VLS was a good example I put up on the slide there that sells into uh, distribution centres. So they've got a particular product that they package together and they're selling probably eight or ten systems a year. And they're not huge deals, but there's no cost of sale at all for us in servicing them to do that. So you know, we hope that that will begin to, um, to grow quite significantly. One other thing, can, can you maybe explain why you chose AIM as the, the right route for, for capital for you? Just a little bit of background to the company uh, as a whole. So uh, uh, I try to say this quite frequently. It's a company <coughs> where the concentration of the, on the business, in particular members of the board, but actually across <coughs> the patch, is, uh, is greater than any other company I've ever been involved in. So, so you know, uh, part of the reason for that is we've always had uh, only ordinary shares. I would suggest that means it's clear cut where everybody stands and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, while we've always been uh, 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 touching all sources of capital and nothing's excluded, it's straight capitalism. Nevertheless, uh, the sources that we found the most agreeable to develop the business uh, uh, have essentially been uh, uh, people like yourselves, uh, uh, knowledgeable, straight, so to speak, investors. And so uh, we didn't have to go uh, uh, on aim. We weren't running out of money or anything like that. Uh, but you know, uh, paranoia versus you know, all the usual thing. We wanted to, to move forward. Um, and even though it was early, it was the best source of compatible money with just concentrating on the business. And uh, that's how it's turned out. And uh, today, or this year, uh, the way I describe it is we're going from a, a situation mm -hmm. where notwithstanding that we were a little small, we knew what we were doing, but we're going from what I describe as sort of IPO light situation, public light, L-I-T-E, to sort of mainstream uh, where the <coughs> opportunities, the processes, the way things work within the company is sort of quite compatible. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think the pain that they said, or the other head, I should say, of being on AIM in relation to having the paper, having the cash, having the opportunity to raise more money and so on has been worth it because we have made acquisitions, the share price has gone up, uh, you know, uh, so far so good and the chance of that continuing, I would have thought as we get to be this sort of, uh, not light, but more appropriate match between a public market and what actually happens, you know, I, I, I think that's likely.